One of the components in, behind our whole theology of work is, um, what is the gospel? What are we saved for? What are we saved from? Uh, what is God doing redemptively in our lives? This is a lot bigger picture. I've got a whole class on sanctification and soteriology. I won't go into that. But I do want to come back and think with you just some foundational principles on what is salvation about. Uh, what is the gospel that we preach? And here at Western, our whole theme is gospel-centered transformation. And it's just what we're about because the gospel is, brings us to Christ and guides your life in Christ. Uh, gives us hope for the future. Gives us hope to be with him on the new earth. It's just a great thing. So what I'd like to do is just think with you just for a few minutes on what is the gospel. So if you will, grab your Bible and... Uh, well, let me think with you just a second. If I were in, you know, First Baptist Church of Elmo, Oregon, I'm sure there is no Elmo, Oregon, so I'm just picking a, na a name. And I'm listening to Pastor Bill preach, and he's a good Bible-believing evangelical guy. And at the end of his sermon, he gives a gospel invitation. What is that gospel invitation most of the time? Uh, if he's a good Bible-believing guy like me, He's probably going to say, uh, you're, you've sinned, you're separated from God, God loves you, Jesus died, if you believe, you're going to heaven. Now, there'd be variations on that, but that's the base gospel that I hear all the time. Because you've sinned, you're headed for hell, God doesn't want that, he loves you, he loves you enough to send his son to die for you. Jesus loves you enough to come and die. Uh, if you receive him as your savior, if you believe in Jesus, then you go to heaven when you die. Now, everything about that is true. The only problem is there's not enough there. Because see, it says nothing, nothing, nothing about our life with Christ today, nothing. It only says we go to heaven when we die. And that's the way a lot of us think is the gospel is about going to heaven when you die. Now, it is that. I don't mean to say it's not. But there's a lot more to it. So what I'd like to do is take you back to the Bible, the paradigmatic, the central, the foundational preaching the gospel. The core central, the simplest statement is in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, and I just... You can look at that, but what I'd like to do is take you back to the first preaching of the gospel in the history of the church. This is in Acts chapter 2. This is the first time the gospel's preached. I'm just going to go through it pretty quickly and lay some foundations here. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, of course, that's when the Holy Spirit is poured out. Uh, the people think they're nuts because they're, they're, their, they're hearing the praise of God in their own languages. And Peter stands up and addresses them, and he says, these guys are not drunk. This is the new covenant. This is Joel chapter 2. This is Ezekiel 36 at work. And then he comes, and here's the gospel. It starts in verse 22, uh, and just some steps. First of all, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to, by God to you with miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you. First stage. Jesus is Emmanuel. Okay, stage one, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. The first stage in the gospel is God has come to us in fulfillment of the promises in the Old Testament, and he is with us. Huge hope. I mean, that's so central. Go back to Genesis 1 and 2, God is with us. The hope through the whole of the Old Testament is God is with us, the whole theology of temple. Uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the looking forward to the new earth, Revelation 21, God is with us. So first of all, he's Emmanuel. Second, verse 23, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. So number two, Jesus was crucified. Okay, we understand that. Number three is verse 24, but God raised him from the dead and it goes on and talks about resurrection for the next several verses. So Jesus Emmanuel, Jesus died, Jesus rose again. Going down to verse, oh gosh, you got it a long ways. You got it all the way down to verse uh, 33. 
summary at verse 32, God has raised Jesus to life, we're all witnesses. Then at 33, we have this, exalted to the right hand of God. So that's the fourth one, Jesus is exalted. He's received from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. So fifth is pouring out the Holy Spirit. These are five things that God has done for us. Jesus came, Emmanuel, died, rose, exalted, poured out the Spirit. Now, next step, uh, verse 37, we see the people beginning to respond. What do we do in response to this gospel? Well, first of all, they're cut to the heart. So first thing we do is convicted. We realize that, gosh, we need a savior. What shall we do, he says. And then Peter answers that. He says, repent. So that's the second thing we do is repent. And when we repent, it means a change of mind about who God is around here. Acts 26, 20, Mark, uh, or sorry, Matthew 3, 8 would be places we see that change of mind. And in that change of mind, uh, the basic change of mind is who's God around here, what are the basic values that drive my life, that's the foundation of repentance. Not change of behavior, that's actually the fruit of repentance. Repentance itself is the change of mind about who is God around here. Changing me as God to Jesus as God, changing the basic values as self-centered, world-centered to Jesus-centered, that's repentance. And then he says, be baptized which is, baptism is like the wedding ceremony of the Christian life. This is when we make a publicly pledged commitment to be lifelong faithful to Jesus. Just like a wedding, two people come together and make a public pledge of their covenantal relationship, promising to be lifelong faithful and all that. That's what baptism is. It's just that pledge, it's an expression of what's already true through repentance. And then down in verse 41, we have the other thing we do. And that is, it says there that they accepted his message, that's faith, and that faith or trust that what God says is true is the other thing we do. So three things we do. We repent, we trust, accept his message, and we express that in baptism, the wedding of our Christian life, so to speak. It's the, that ceremony that we do. So five things God did. You remembering these? <laughs> Jesus Emmanuel died, rose, exalted, poured out the Spirit. Three things we do, conviction, repentance, trust, rebel, uh, re baptism, expressed in baptism. Actually, I guess there's four things if I look at it that way. And then there are five things that we get, starting at verse 38. Uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. First thing we get is forgiveness of sin. That's related to justification, which is about the forgiveness of sin as acceptance as children of God. So we get forgiveness of sin, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now that gift of the Holy Spirit is the whole new heart promise of the, of the new covenant, Ezekiel 36, Joel 2. When the Holy Spirit comes, he indwells us and he regenerates us. Now, big argument about the order of faith and regeneration. I'm just going to skip all that because uh, it's irrelevant what I'm saying here. But regeneration is the when the Holy Spirit or the poor, the coming of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit indwells us, regenerates us, gives us a new heart. So my fundamental desires are changed. Uh, it's a Powerful thing. So I just call this the new life. So we get justific we get uh, forgiveness of sins or justification. We get the Holy Spirit, new life, regeneration. And then we keep reading verse uh, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders, miracles, and signs were done by the apostles. All the all the believers were together, had everything in common. And what we're talking about here is a, devoted to a new community. 
then this new community is not just a, you know, a garden club. It's a supernatural community of spirit where God is at work, where we do see him at work in lots of different ways, ranging from miracles, which happens at his will, to just people sharing and loving each other, which really is a, a work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then it talks about here, as we go on to the end of the chapter, that they were in the temple courtyard, they were praising God and enjoying favor of all people. That's the new mission. And this new mission that we have is joining God's kingdom mission, God's uh, rescue mission to bring lost people back to himself into that new community, into the fellowship of God. And then, interestingly, here in Acts chapter 2, it never talks about going to heaven when we die. Now that's implied, and it's there later on. We see it, for example, in Stephen. As he's dying, he's expecting to be at the right hand of Jesus. So it'd be a fifth thing, new hope. Okay, so the five things we get, do you follow all this? Five things we get are forgiveness, justification, poured out spirit, new life, regeneration. Uh, we get a new community, supernatural community of spirit. We get a new mission. We join with God in his rescue mission in the world, and that's what work is about. And then we get a new hope. Now, let me summarize this. Uh, five things God does. Jesus comes, Emmanuel, died, rose, exalted, pours out the Spirit. Four things we do, conviction, repentance, accept the message, faith, and baptism. Five things we get, forgiveness, justification, poured out Spirit, regeneration, indwelling Holy Spirit, new heart, new community, of the Spirit, new mission, doing God's work in the world, restoring shalom, new hope that will be with Jesus forever in the new earth. That's the basics of the gospel. Now, a lot more to do here, uh, and I've written this up uh, in a book that Mark Driscoll did called Doctrine. It's also in Vintage Church, the book we did there, uh, and I'll put a section of that on the CD so you can get it. But this is really foundational. This is really foundational stuff. Let me talk just a little bit more. Um, what do you have to do to be saved? What do you have to do to be saved? Well, in the gospel that we just went through, we have a response to God's working. God works in five things. Emmanuel died, rose, exalted, poured out the Spirit. And God is at work there. So the incarnation, God comes to us. The death, I mean, whew, Father and Son partnering together to do the propitiatory sacrifice. Resurrection, the new life that comes there. Exaltation, triumph over the hostile powers, the demonic powers, all that, pouring out the Holy Spirit. God is at work. Cool. I don't have to do anything to be on his team. I don't have to do anything to impress him. In fact, I've depressed him by being an enemy and a sinner and helpless, Romans chapter 5. So what do I do? My side of it is just to receive the gift. Uh, so it's salvation alone, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from all meritorious works, all that. Absolutely. I just received the gift. And again, there's a debate between Calvinists and Armenians about some of the details, but it's everybody believes it's all by grace. It's not any meritorious work of any kind on my part. However, that's not the end of salvation. Salvation is coming to Christ, but salvation is also being in the new community and a part of the new mission. That's what we often call sanctification. And in sanctification, we do work. Um, well, look at it by Ephesians chapter 2. And there's, uh, you know Ephesians 2. Let's do a different one. How about Titus 3? Uh, just to let you look. You can look at Ephesians 2. You know that one really well. He created us for good works, which he's prepared for us to walk in them. But Titus chapter 3 is another gospel summary. 
Uh, one time, Titus 3.3, 3. at one time you're foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved, yikes, bad stuff. Whew. Verse 4, but when the kindness of love our God our Savior appeared, he saved us. There it is. Not because of righteous things we have done. So it's not that we've impressed him to be on his team, but because of his mercy. That's the five things he does. He saved us through the washing and rebirth, renewal by the Holy Spirit. That's the regenerating work that he does. The Holy Spirit, which he poured out us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so it had been justified by his grace, we might become heirs of the hope of eternal life. You recognize all those themes we've just been talking about in the gospel. But here's verse 8. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. So we're part of that community of the Spirit and we're doing the mission of God and there we devote ourselves. Uh, Second Peter says, make every effort. Uh, do a search sometime on that little phrase, make every effort, and you'll find that there's a lot of effort in the Christian life not to get us saved, but to live out that new life we have in us. Philippians uh, says that. Uh, gosh, it's powerful stuff. Now here's the thing. Works are not the foundation of our salvation, ever. Mm -mm. Nope, nope, nope. What they are is the fruit of that indwelling Holy Spirit and the regeneration. It's not that I'm it, it, I'm living out that life that's in it, that, that supernatural life of the Spirit that's in me. I just live it out. And there's a piece of which I work hard to do that. And I'm doing that in the community, and I'm doing that in the mission of God, uh, those points of the gospel. And when I do that, that's the gospel at work. When I work uh, in that supernatural community, like in Acts chapter 2 or Acts 4, or other places where I'm sharing things with my fellow believers, that's God's work. The shalom, the human flourishing that we talk about, the community where everything is in place, where justice and righteousness are happening. We can look at those modules too. Uh, but the other piece is in that the divine mission, when I love my neighbor as myself, uh, and who is my neighbor? Well, it's even out to the Samaritan, even out to the enemy. Uh, Jesus, very powerful there in the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemy. Romans chapter 12. Overcome evil with good. It, and what you do to your enemy is you give him food. That's the gospel at work. So the work that we do is in service of God, loving our neighbor as God loves the neighbor. And that, that work we do, not the foundation of our faith. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No, 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 no. But the fruit of our faith. And that's where we participate with God together in that doing. So, basic idea of, of gospel. A lot more to do here, but this is just the, the foundational piece. And I hope this gets some stuff clarified so that you can understand how gospel relates to work.